Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth edition of Resilience and Adaptation, a new series brought to you by 1014 and the American Council on Germany. And I'm Katja Wiesbrock Donovan, Chief Officer at 1014. Each week, we will be joined by experts from both sides of the Atlantic to talk about the pressing challenges that are emerging around the globe. The corona crisis, with its lockdown measures, has served as a catalyst for what some people have called turbo digitalization, with more activity moving online. But it also exposes an even deeper digital divide. This is true in Europe and in the United States, but also on a global scale. Joining us today to talk about digitalization during the corona crisis are Geisha Joost and Mona Sloan. Thank you both for joining us. Great Thanks. for having us. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Geisha Joost is Professor of Design Research at the Berlin University of the Arts and heads the Design Research Lab at Telecom Innovation Laboratories. She also chairs the German Society for Design Theory and Research. Mona Sloan is a sociologist based at the New York University's Institute for Public Knowledge and an adjunct professor at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. She researches the intersection of design and inequality in the context of AI innovation, policy, and ethics. We'd like to remind everybody that ACG and 1014 are both independent, nonpartisan organizations. The views expressed during this conversation are those of our speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of either ACG or 1014. I'd also like to say that if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please use the chat function on Zoom. You can also send an email to sokol at acgusa.org and I will fold your questions into the conversation. There was an active debate about the opportunities and challenges posed by digitalization, even before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now that debate has taken on a new dimension and an urgent need for discussion. With lockdown measures in place, many people have turned online for education, work, administrative business, shopping, and even for socializing. So we'd like to ask you both the same general opening question. Mona, let's perhaps start with you. How do you interpret this uptick in digitalization? And what do you think will be the lasting consequences in Europe and in the United States? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Katja and Steven, so much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to see Geisha again um, in this digital space. Thank you for bringing us together. I really appreciate it. I also want to just take a brief moment to acknowledge that by being in New York City, I'm standing on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. And I would ask you and the, our viewers to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community and the indigenous communities on whose land you may be currently located and to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, to start the conversation and answer, uh, or try to answer your question, I think um, I would ask back, what do we actually mean by digitization or digitalization? And I would urge us to think about the many different ways in which we have seen digitization uh, become part of our everyday life and the organization of society over the past decade. Um, and so as a sociologist, I would be interested in looking at what are the systems of power that underpin uh, this process and that we're seeing perhaps uh, exacerbated by this process, by the lockdown and by the fact that we are all, uh, or many of us are dependent on these digital technologies to keep, uh, to continue with our daily lives, to continue with work if we are fortunate enough to still have work, um, which is especially a, an issue here in the United States. And I would also perhaps urge us to think about who is affected um, by this digitization or by the pandemic and the intersection of the two in what kinds of ways. So we're seeing certain populations um, being able to actually lock down and continue work. And we're seeing other populations who are more vulnerable um, communities who are uh, essential workers and who are exposed and who are affected by the pandemic in a different way and who are also a sort of affected by digitization along those lines in a different way. Um, I think one of the things we can um, remember is 
on a positive note is that there are many possibilities that are opening up now, perhaps in the way in which we organize ourselves through uh, a digital interaction and, and a digital way of being together. Um, but that we, so we can perhaps think about how we can, how we can push for things like a remote, remote work in the context of um, organizing family life um, and things like that. But as a, again, as a sociologist, I would always urge us to think those things uh, along the lines of how can we actually address social divides that were already in place be, be, before the pandemic. And I'm going to leave it at that and hand over to Geisha perhaps. Yeah, very good. This very much links to what uh, what I observe here in Germany. So on the positive side, you know, we were waiting so long that digital becomes the new normal. So because, you know, Germany is very slow in, you know, embracing the digital transformation, we are very kind of a bit like technophobians. We are very critical about digital technologies and very kind of, yeah, very much resonating about, you know, what are the negative and the dark side. But now it's, you know, you see myself, I'm working in the home office, you know, homeschooling is the new normal. And in, in just a few days, we just switched to a digital life as the new normal. So this is in a way something that I really appreciate very much that we are now kind of uh, in the in the now we are now we we entered the digital realm so this is the positive side but the negative side is that the pandemic is like uh, like kind of a, a burning glass so we see a uh, digital uh, inequalities very much the so one debate that just started like a week ago in germany is uh, gender inequality so it's it's the women that are at home you know trying to deal with with the kids trying to deal with their kind of uh, working from home uh, have to do all the kind of homeschooling uh, stuff so they they are really um very much kind of um yeah have to have to have to to to, to have all these kind of uh, balances um on their shoulders and this this is really um, a very kind of dark side of, of the digitization that we are seeing there. And, um, and it's like many tensions that were already there um, kind of uh, are coming out now even worse. And this, this is really the, the bad learning out of these few weeks of the lockdown that we were uh, having. And the kind of a bit, the hope that we had in the first like two or three weeks um, that maybe we come out of this crisis with more solidarity, with more equality, and with maybe a bit a, a better also work-life balance, a better analog digital balance. This is not that true uh, anymore. So there's a lot of kind of debate happening now. Thank you so much. And you know, before we uh, you know take a closer look at uh, the social inequalities, I would just like to ask, you know, has this become the new normal? Or, you know, you said, you know, you were impressed how quickly our digital life switched, you know, how quickly we switched our lives to the digital realm in, in just a few days. So um, is this now the new normal and how, what do you think about the adjustment? Right, just a quick follow on to, to both of you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think um, it, it, well, I'm going to start with a positive note. I'm going to take Geisha's template and, and start with a positive note. I'm mightily impressed by everybody who has, by every single one of us who has um, made this transition um, as successful as it is right now. Um, you know, and, and sort of we are, con we, we haven't yet um, plunged into a complete disaster, touch wood, and, um, and, and social life is continuing. Um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the term new normal because I think what we, you know, what is, what is, what is normal, right? Like what do we consider to be um, an acceptable status quo and, and for whom? I will say, and I can speak from my experience as being in uh, higher education here in the United States and being an educator, there are certainly um, fundamental shifts that are happening right now in terms of digital education, for example, thinking about how we can continue um, continue that and, and while we are managing um, the pandemic on campus. Um, and that include, includes a whole a lot of innovation around um, you know, uh, remote teaching, remote learning, perhaps hybrid um, models that we're exploring. 
So there are some interesting um, things happening. Um, but again, I would, I would urge us to think about, and I know that Geisha has uh, done a really uh, impressive bit of research on that. I would encourage us to think about the digital divide in that context as well, right? Who can actually, uh, who has the ability to engage in these, uh, in these uh, remote learning um, tools and sessions? Who has uh, the social infrastructure to do that? Who has the economic capital to do that? Um, and that is something we have to absolutely think while we think about what the new normal could be. Um, and I, I, I do believe that it is our role as social scientists and as educators um, to push for that. And I want to just hand that over to Geisha because I know she's recently written about that. Yeah, it's, it's very much as, as you're saying. So those for whom this is the new normal are those who are profiting from digitization anyhow. You know, all the people who are engaged also in digital work, who, who were working partly from home anyhow, you know, who uh, embrace also kind of globalization, who have the good paid and well paid jobs. And those for those for, for whom it's not the new normal are those, you know, the nurses, the kind of teachers in the kindergarten, the, the, the people working at the cashier at the supermarket. So those who are now kind of seen maybe the first time in their lives that they are really relevant to keep the, everything going and they are underpaid, they are exposed to the rivals and they don't kind of profit from, you know, they cannot work from home. And then they have to also handle, you know, where, where, where should I leave my kids and so on. So it's really kind of uh, very much the, the divide, divide, divide that we are say, seeing. And my hope is, I don't know whether it will become true, but my hope is that these kind of people who are working on these jobs um, might be better recognized and not just kind of virtually applauded or something, but really also better paid. And that, you know, we see that these, these, these jobs, these people who, who keep the system running, um, that they are so relevant for, for, for our society and that they should also profit more from, uh, from our system. So this is maybe also two kind of very extreme poles that, that we see today in our everyday life. So I'd like to unpack um, this issue around social equity a little bit more, but before we, before we move on to that, um, I want to push you both a little bit, Mona and Geisha. Um, I think one of the questions that, that Katya and I are trying to understand is, what do you think might be the same after this pandemic in terms of you know, more dependence on digitalization? Um, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, as they're working from home, moving all of their activities online, whether it's their kids being educated online, whether it's online banking has, I'm sure, you know, seen a huge uptick, um, whether it's working from home for those that can. I'd be really interested in hearing from both of you whether you think that this is a pattern that's likely to continue, not just while we're locked down, but will this really be the new normal? Or do you think um, that things will sort of snap back? Two weeks ago, I thought this will stay, so this will rest. And we saw, you know, Twitter was saying, you know, everybody could work from home. So, um, you know, this is kind of a new status. Um, but now I'm not so sure anymore. So maybe we will see, because also so many people in Germany are also, again, kind of criticizing digital technologies. We are, you know, we are mad about data protection, about privacy. Um, and so, so maybe we will also see a kind of backlash again in this kind of new uh, digital spaces that, that, that we are kind of discovering. So this is, uh, this is really, but still, so, um, so many from the young generation, so we have this big, you know, Fridays for Future um, movement. So many of the young generation are very concerned about, of course, sustainability, climate change, and they will have a really focus on uh, sustainability and avoiding to travel, avoiding, you know, taking the plane and having these opportunities that we were experiencing now that we will meet online uh, very frequently and th this is working. And, you know, we, we, we were proving that this is working. I hope that we will see that these kind of two um, requirements will come together, sustainability and taking these opportunities of meeting virtually, working virtually together. And um, so I hope that there will be a, the, the big push also from the young generation, letting this um, stay for us as a, as a big opportunity. 
Yeah, sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, no I was just gonna say, go ahead, Mona. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So I would actually, I, I fully um, agree with that. What I would also uh, say as a sociologist, I, I would caution us to think about um, sort of what is the social glue that holds us all together, that reminds us, us of our collective humanity, and how can we uphold the kinds of social infrastructures that we have built um, to, to ensure a, a equitability in society and, and a functioning democracy. And so and when we talk about the new normal and we talk about all these practices that are currently digital and whether or not they will become analog again or we'll, we'll see hybrid versions of that is um, what, what are the ones that we absolutely need to be all of these things? And the, one of the institutions that I'm thinking about is, for example, the library, the public library as a space um, where people come together as a space for education, as a space for, that fosters social cohesion, as a space that provides uh, tools and digital infrastructures as well as all kinds of other infrastructures um, that really is a vital element of a functioning uh, or healthy democracy. And so when I think about what is the new normal, what, you know, what will change, what will, what will stay the same, um, I'm thinking about how can we ensure that, we, that the good stuff works on all levels. Uh, and, and is available for everybody. And how can we think that in a way that is healthy, healthy for a society? So rather than thinking about whether or not um, the, sh the chatbot of my local bank works or not, I'd be thinking about how can I ensure that my 93 year old neighbor who lives downstairs can do his banking? What kinds of infrastructures need to be put in place so that everybody can access these services, whether they are private or, or public? Thank you. So let's let's turn to the social inequities. Um, we've you know touched on them a little bit. You've both you've both spoken a little bit about it, um, and how it manifests itself in our society. But I guess I'd like to to shift a little bit and and rather than ask you for more examples, although you're welcome to give them, um, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about what sort of digital skill sets, what sorts of tools you think people need. Um, and how we might be able to give people that moving forward. I think, um, Geisha, you, know, you just had an article in the German weekly Die Zeit. Um, you talked in that article a little bit about how um, hopeful everybody had been with the advent of digitalization and that uh, the, the actual situation is not necessarily meeting the high expectations that people had for a more equal society. We see, thank you very much for the question. We see very much that all the kind of measures that are taken, for example, digital education, are targeting always the same kind of small little group of people who are, you know, the beneficiaries anyhow. So, and all many of the kind of also political measures that are taken, for example, you know, digital startups funding or, um, you know, very high profile digital education programs online. Uh, they always target those who are, you know, who are well off anyhow. And we see uh, a, a huge number of people who, who think that digitization is just, uh, you know, watching YouTube in a way, who are just kind of consuming digital media. And so we, we see this digital divide there very much. And we missed out the opportunity in the last years in Germany to provide digital education to anybody, to, to, you know, to, to everybody from elementary school on and also we can and we should have a critical reflection also of using digital media of um, designing digital tools uh, of maybe the ramifications of the use of ai and all these kind of critical debates of course should happen but they should be informed and we should have a kind of general data literacy for, for you know provided to, to everybody to understand what we are talking about because if we take this example of the tracing app um, you know, so many people in Germany just um, would never embrace such a technology and they are totally afraid of what this might bring to us because it is just kind of communicated as a tracing app and nobody understands what we are talking about. You know, is this the kind of centralized or decentralized architecture? Is it open source? Is it, you know, what kind of technology is behind it? Nobody understands a word of this kind of expert discussions that we have because we did not provide the kind of access to this knowledge that you have to have in terms of uh, you know using it 
criticizing it, being part of the, of the debate and participating in the digital society. So this is really a huge, um, something that we missed out in the last years in Germany very much. And we are also in the kind of European, let's say ranking, we, we are not a, a very kind of, uh, um, yeah, a, a, a country that, that succeeded in the last years. So it's very different compared to, to Denmark, for example, or other Nordic countries who are, who are much better prepared for this. Uh, on the topic of digital literacy, uh, we have a viewer's question. And um, uh, so the viewer asked the question, is there a generational difference between the young and, and the adults uh, on, on this topic? So is it easier for young people or older people sort of to, to tackle this, this new, um, this, this challenge? I don't know, Mona, maybe you wanna uh, take this? <laughs> sure, I'll take this one. Um, I will say that I have not conducted a research, a research project on this, but I will say that there are, as far as I'm aware, there are studies that obviously indicate, uh, indicated a generational divide in, in digital literacy, um, for sure. Um, but, and I can also say as an educator um, and, you know, teaching the next generation, I can re really very much see that the younger generation is, you know, very, very skilled. What I'm worried about is that we are um, having this huge potential of this young generation who sort of really know, for example, can there are studies that, that show that the younger the generation Z can detect um, fake videos much easier and fake news much easier than older generations. So there's a lot about sort of political messaging here as well. That's interesting. Um, that we are not necessarily building on that natural skill set that they have. So we are not seeing uh, young people in power that much, you know, and we, I think we really, and Gage and I have been talking about that quite a bit, we really need to think about how we can integrate uh, the next generation uh, into a f fundamental decision making about digitization and so on. So, um, and in a positive way. And um, Steve, what you just talked about really reminded me of the work of Mariana Mazzucato, who was an economist at the University College London, who wrote the wonderful book called The Entrepreneurial State, who says, well, actually, the state has, uh, has a, the function of creating markets and, and pushing innovation. This is not coming out of the private sector. Over the course of history, we have seen states heavily investing into um, a GPS, the internet, the iPhone. She shows how the iPhone came about through, through uh, government funding. So in that function, if we can maybe think about that also in terms of policy, we can perhaps overcome this polarization um, that we see between sort of innovation on the one hand and regulation on the other hand when it comes to technology, but maybe think them in a more integrated way, especially in Germany. Thank you. Um, uh, while we're talking about um, uh, digital literacy, let's sort of maybe shift to education. One of the, the questions that we had for both of you is whether educational systems in Germany and the US are set up in such a way that we might be able to overcome this digital divide by giving people um, the tools and abilities to deal with them. But we've also gotten a couple of, of viewer questions. Um, one is, how can we make sure that educators are able to teach students to be in a digital world? How do we teach them responsibility around social media and that sort of thing? Um, and then another question, from uh, someone else here in the New York area who's curious about whether or not there's a, a country, a community, a school district that's doing an exceptional job when it comes to closing the digital divide, perhaps someplace either in Germany or in the US that could serve as a model for the rest of us. Very good question. So um, I think currently the structure of, of our education system is not, uh, is not fit to, um, to address this uh, this need so it isn't um, so what we see very much in Germany are very much kind of informal initiatives and bottom-up initiatives and kind of parental initiatives that push for digital education from elementary school level on and this is always again those who are well off anyhow you know who can afford also maybe to send their kids to a private school so this is a very bad situation we have uh, in the recent years we have put up a kind of funding program uh, from a federal government 
um, just to to get internet to the to the schools. So this is a kind of the basic infrastructure that is is in many parts kind of lacking behind. So this is really kind of we have to do our homework there very much, and we don't have a kind of real kind of life cycle. Um, a view for you know providing education also for elderly people or for, for people on in in every kind of different different stage of their lives so it's very kind of fragmented the the uh, infrastructure and you could argue that you know the knowledge is there it's all kind of in these kind of formats that we are having now here so in a webinar it's 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 on the internet but the awareness is not there yet so this is really a kind of um uh, and not a good state uh, and not a good starting point. And one example also from my university. So when we had the lockdown from uh, Corona crisis, so we are, of course, we are not able to enter university. And then we had a Zoom meeting like we are having now with 55 participants with the head of, uh, of university talking kind of generally about how to deal with digital education, kind of as you know as the internet was would have just been invented so it was not kind of a debate of you know how do we do it what kind of tool do we use but kind of starting the debate in the moment of the crisis and i was you know oh my goodness so <laughs> what did you do the last kind of 20 years and th this is this is really the the bad thing and and we were learning fast so it's kind of working out quite well but it's, uh, it's really kind of, uh, we see now the consequences of the, the, the years that we were lacking, um, lacking behind. And I see the best examples really from bottom up initiatives from a kind of uh, a seniors computer club in Berlin who are kind of teaching themselves at the age of 82 or 83, how to um, make the best of the internet. So it's, uh, it's more the informal sector that I see here. And Mona, I'd like to ask you sort of with your two hats, right, as a sociologist, but also as an educator, what are your thoughts on the role that education can play? And are there any innovative models that we should be looking at? Thank you, Steve. That's a very good question. Um, I would I would not say that there is a silver bullet anywhere. I, at least I don't see it. Um, also not here in the New York area or, or in the United States. I think we're all um, working hard to make this work for everybody on the on the side of higher education institutions some in certain ways <laughs> some in other ways um but i do think um these ground these bottom up uh, initiatives that uh geisha has mentioned are crucial i do think um what we need to consider is that there is certainly additional pressure on educators to learn this super quickly as as geisha has said and and sort of this is um not just about skill right this is not just about how can i produce my core like quite professionally produce a sort of media version or online version of my class this is about how can i be an educator in a space whereby I cannot be in a classroom with my students. So this is so much more, um, you know, than just recording your lecture. This is about being there for your students, understanding them, understanding their individual uh, life situations. I have students who had to pick up extra work because their families were plunged into, um, into economic crisis and there, there's unemployment, or they have care duties, or they have really bad internet, or they have, you know, they have to drive to the nearest a Starbucks to sit in the car and attend the lecture. Um, there's all these kinds of different layers that that there are to education that are uh, need to be thought of along, you know, while we think about how we do this digitally. Um, and good examples, I can just share really from my from my experience at New York University is just um, being in close, you know, in close contact with your cohort, with your students, and sort of perhaps um, let go a little bit of the hierarchical organization that we have sometimes in higher education, you know, whereby, you know, my, my, my students have my WhatsApp number, for example. Um, and um, I, I, I try to be there for them and sort of give, give them um, the support that they need that they would typically get in the classroom that way. So I would say these are um, and I see that with my colleagues as well. These are examples of 
good examples whereby we're coming closer together. But that requires a lot of labor, a lot of social and emotional labor um, among educators. And we need to think about how we value that and how we um, um, don't just take that for granted and how we also provide infrastructures and, and, and trainings for educators so they can do that work without breaking themselves. Thank you so much. So let's uh, maybe move from the educational system uh, to the workplace. Uh, and we already talked about uh, essential workers, you know, work that's now deemed essential. Uh, and we do have uh, two more viewer questions. Uh, one viewer would like to, to know from you um, if you see a difference in the United States and, and Germany of uh, how these essential workers now are treated. Uh, and another viewer would like to see um, what do you think uh, this digitalization, how does it affect the German work week? <laughs> Maybe us in the United States. So is that, you know, so what, what are basically the implications uh, of, of the situation now uh, for the workplace? Very good question. Oh, do you want to start? Mona? Go ahead, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, very, very good question. So one is the essential workers. I think it's not yet decided whether they will come uh, kind of better off the, uh, after the crisis. Because what we see is that, that we are now uh, starting to, to really uh, acknowledge them. So this is already a big change because beforehand they were kind of invisible. And, uh, and now we started the debate on, um, on their salary. We, we started the debate on their working conditions, um, for example, for, for working in the hospital. And we started to see the importance of their work and their engagement in um, you know, caring for the people and solving the crisis. So this is, there's a lot of acknowledgement. And we saw also from different European countries, we saw uh, on social media, many people kind of, you know, applauding and, you know, giving them a big thank and kind of all these kind of demonstrations of, uh, you know, we acknowledge your work. Thank you so much. So this is a kind of very good starting point for now really negotiating for better working conditions. And maybe also of um, taking up the debate again on how to value work in general so kind of care working or family work working at home so what's the value for our society and how does this relate to the salary so because this is really kind of a broken uh, broken relationship so we should rethink this kind of how we value and and uh, what, what's the what's the value of of these kinds of working uh, um, conditions so this is the, the first answer to that so i hope for better working conditions there too and the second thing for the working week, this is also a very uh, interesting one. We had, let's say five years ago, we had those kind of silly debates that if you work uh, in a home office, that uh, big companies like Deutsche Telekom, that they should kind of shut down their mail server at five o'clock in the afternoon so that people are not tended, uh, tempted to, uh, to answer the emails uh, in, in the evening. And this is totally silly because you should be very flexible, of, especially when you have kids, to maybe in the afternoon um, not, you know, check your emails, but, you know, bring the kids to bed or whatever or play with them and then have the evening hours for, for more working. So they're kind of where very analog models in their heads. But now it's really uh, shifting. So we saw also in these few weeks of the lockdown, we saw very different working models and very much flexibility also for the working hours, for the availability, for kids running around uh, in the background of your home office. So there's a lot of learnings in the last week. So I hope to see also more flexibility there. And I see the first signs that people also from big companies also like, like SAP or like uh, Telecom or like other big companies are now much more allowing for, for home office uh, working and for different and flexible working hours because they were seeing that it's just working. So it's, it's fine. So it's, it's effective and it's, it allows more work-life balance. So I think on the both questions, kind of more positive uh, note on that. Yeah, I mean, I can perhaps add a bit of the American perspective. Um, I am deeply concerned that not much will change simply here in the United States for uh, the reason that this, uh, the, the healthcare system is one, um, is, you know, 
organized along the lines of, of capitalism, essentially um, extractive practices uh, and, and exploitative labor practices. One of the things that we're seeing here in the US is that actually because there, is, there are no elective surgeries at the moment that hospitals are going bankrupt and they're actually you know, closing down. And um, we're seeing um, healthcare workers completely overworked, not being compensated. We are in a, in a situation where but there is no um, you know, maternity leave, for example, on, on, on the federal level where, where um, there, there is no sick leave. And so there, there really is, so much infrastructure work that needs to be done here uh, to just get to a level where Germany is, I think, at the moment, which is with a functioning welfare state, um, that I am, um, I am hopeful because I think we cannot afford not to be hopeful, but I do think there's a lot of work to be done here, a lot of policy work, um, and I am, I am concerned and I, and I am in awe um, you know, when I see our, our healthcare workers here in the US, especially New York, really saving the city and, um, and applauding them at 7 p.m. is wonderful every day, but it's certainly not enough. So I'd like to maybe switch gears a little bit um, and move away from the conversation about the digital divide to something else that I think affects all of us. Um, as we've been grappling with managing the pandemic, there's been a lot of discussion about contact tracing. And Geisha, you touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, but of course, there's a dark side to contact tracing, and that is it is a surveillance tool that is being used. Um, so, so Geisha, I'd like to, to maybe start with you and ask you about your just general thoughts on the ethics of contact tracing. So my personal view is that it would be a wonderful tool as a complementary approach to the measures that are taken if you do it like we are planning to do it now in Germany. So in an anonymized version with kind of decentralized architecture, with kind of just Bluetooth technology, so not tracing or not tracking your location, all these kinds of um, privacy measures that are taken. And so there would be the opportunity to also showcase to the German public that big data analytics could serve us, you know, could help us in kind of controlling the pandemic. But currently we are missing out this opportunity to really showcase this and to do a kind of really good ethical framing of a technology and to really, you know, do something really valuable because we are, so the, the, the history of the kind of this tracing app uh, uh, debate in Germany is hilarious. You know, we started weeks ago, you know, announcing how we should have this kind of app. Then we were building up a European consortium of experts, of scientists who should kind of fix an architecture and develop something. Then they just kind of broke apart because they, you know, were negotiating about the technology and they could not, you know, make up their mind of what would be the best solution. Then they kind of stopped it. Then Apple and, uh, um, and Google kind of went, uh, together to, to create the API for, the, for using the Bluetooth technology. And now we have kind of two big German companies like SAP and Telecom, they now have to fix it. So it's a kind of, you know, what, what are we talking about? So we missed out really the opportunity to making really something good based on our ethical values and of the standards. And now also the kind of the, um, the reaction of the German uh, citizens is so negative. So they are really totally afraid of this technology. They, they see it, you know, that, that the government will do kind of surveillance on us. They are tracing us, they are tracking us. So it's a, so many misconceptions now uh, up, uh, up and running before we even have the app. So it's like, <laughs> but I guess, you know, and, and you've touched on this a little bit, but I guess that, you know, the, the big question in this, or, or one of the questions in this whole puzzle, in this whole mosaic, is what happens to all of the data that's being generated, whether it's through new tools like contact tracing, or whether it's also through the increased online activity that we talked about at the outset, through education, through work, through shopping online, and so, Mona, I'd like to, to turn to you. You recently had an article in the Daily Beast, and you argued that the data that's being collected might actually become the tools of oppression tomorrow. 
So can you share with us a little bit about your concerns about data collection today and what that means for the future? Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. So um, what um, Albert Fox Khan and I, my co-author on the piece, were trying to say there was that, um, yes, we do need to be concerned around, uh, we do have to have concerns around uh, large scale data collection, uh, especially in relation to health data. Uh, and we need to think about what actually classifies as health data initially in a pandemic. Is it literally whether or not you have contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and have become ill with COVID-19 or is it all kinds of other things, you know, um, what you've eaten, what your genetic uh, information is, what you watch online, all these things. So um, we need to be careful about that. What we also need to be careful about is not just the actual collection of whatever counts as health data, but the creation of the models based on that. So um, especially if we think about um, predictive analytics and the use of predictive technologies in industries such as insurance uh, or in the, in the financial industry. Uh, so questions on whether or not you, um, you get a loan, for example. So the creation of these models, um, that, that's something that could, be, could further entrench um, did inequities that we're seeing and sort of really entrench the way in which um, systemic oppression of communities that have already been oppressed, that are already at a systemic uh, disadvantage, continues into the future in perpetuity, as it were, because they're, being, because they're being used. And we're not talking about that. And that's why we framed that as tools of oppression. So what happens once the data is aggregated and used? You know, it's anonymized, it's all private, you know, but what, what, what are we doing with these, with these kinds of models? And that's, that really is a big risk. And there's terrific scholarship um, that is building around that, that we need to integrate into the policy discourse around that. And we do need to see um, representatives of these communities at the table. We cannot just be talking about disadvantaged communities. We need to have them at the policy table, at the tables where these, these uh, apps are being designed, um, you know, in, in the uh, upper echelons of power, as it were. Um, and that is something we're not quite seeing yet. And um, what is really, um, let me add, I add one more dimension, what is quite, um, uh, interesting and, and a little bit terrifying is that we're could potentially be seeing uh, new laws being built around that that facilitate uh, sort of large scale su surveillance. We've seen that in the aftermath of 9-11 and these are bad laws that uh, that stick, right? I don't see that maybe not as much of a risk in Germany, but certainly here. And let's also think about the fact that, that for example, the general data protection regulation, so the omnibus uh, regulatory framework of the European Union with regards to data protection that specifically allow makes a lot of exemptions for pandemics explicitly. The word contact tracing and pandemic is in the GDPR. So there are exemptions in existing frameworks that we celebrate as protecting us at a large scale and we need to be looking at that as well. Thank you so much and, and this of course you know, opens, opens up a whole Difference <laughs> element we could take uh, talk about Europe and the United States and the difference in, in data protection. But before we maybe do that, I would just like to uh, just really uh, get a, ask you to to provide a few examples. So uh, Mona, you talked about the tools of oppression. Uh, you kind of said you know models could be created. You mentioned the financial industry, insurance industry. But I think you know for for people like me, uh, it's even if I gain more data science literacy, it's, it's really hard to imagine how this data could be used for, you know, what people call population management. So could you give a few examples of, you know, data collected, what could governments and what could, you know, profit oriented, you know, private industry, what can they do with it to, to manipulate or to, to push consumers in a certain direction? Okay. Yeah, thank <laughs> Please, yeah, guess, exactly. do you wanna? I, I will follow up on the social scoring system in China. <laughs> okay, I'm glad we, we got that covered. Um, okay, so basically, um, 
what could happen is that we are sort of seeing a justification of a large scale data collection. What is data? Data can be anything. A data point can be anything. Um, where you live, how old you are, your um, ethnic background and the racial category that you're being put into. Um, it could be your educational background, your income, um, uh, in the context of the pandemic, whether or not you contact, contracted the virus, whether you fell ill or not, um, who you've been in touch with, um, sort of, but also things like what, you know, what movies do you watch and sort of, this could all be uh, assembled together and sort of uh, this data could be inferred to create uh, profiles and these profiles could be um, used to uh, predict future behaviors or future outcomes. So for example, whether or not you're likely to um, develop um, a certain disease or uh, you are very prone to um, a bad back, which is very expensive for, for insurance companies or whether or not you are prone to um, have ill, um, um, bad mental health further down the line. And so that could be that sort of predictive analytic or that predictive the predictive analytic and your profile could be used in the future and could be sold, for example, to an insurance company who then uses that as part of calculating how much you're being charged for the insurance you want to purchase. Or whether, you know, or, or a bank could use that to determine whether or not you get a loan because if you fall ill, you are, if you're likely to fall ill, you're likely to default on your loan, so you're not going to get it because they want their money back. Right, and so, um, and, and what we really need to understand is that the, the predictive analytic, the model, is created based on this large data pool um, that is collected that can potentially uh, entail so many different data points. You know, that's one of, the, one of the big sort of inventions of big data uh, in general, but specifically, um, that sort of deep learning is that 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 uh, correlations and, and and not causations and we can talk about the difference between those two are are, uh, are found in in or patterns are found in these large scale data sets which then serve as a basis for dis automated decision making and then the model is released into the wild and these deep learning uh, technologies mean that it, the, the algorithm continues to teach itself as it, it, you know, as it, as it, it moves through the wild. So it, it, it can adapt, but fundamentally it, it is um, based on a particular model, a particular logic, a particular pattern. Um, and so that's where it could potentially get dangerous because we're talking about scale, right? We're not talking about one-on-one, -on -one. we're talking about this affecting millions of people. We've seen this in Michigan um, where, um, uh, the state of Michigan introduced an automated fraud detection tool and um, I think 50,000 people, I could be wrong, were affected by that and, and, and were flagged as um, potentially committing fraud and lost um, their benefits and there's now a class action lawsuit. So that's the way in which this could happen. And then hand over to Geisha. Yeah, just adding one, one detail, exactly how you were saying. And, and in, in China, it's just happening now. So it's all integrated in WeChat. So it's totally convenient. So, you know, you do anything with WeChat. So, you know, you, you, you pay your, the rent for your flat via WeChat. You, you order um, a, a, a DD, so the kind of equivalent to Uber. Um, you know, you, you, you book your table at the restaurant and so on. So it's all integrated in WeChat. It's very convenient. It's a very nice interface. So very kind of easygoing. And this is all kind of, kind of collecting all the data about you. And this is used by the government. So the government has access to all these kind of data. And this is kind of creating the profile. And it's, it's all up and running. So they have pilots all over China. Um, in kind of in competition, how to use this these data and how to use the social scoring system, and in fact, so if you have a low score, you don't get a visum, so you you cannot book a train ticket, you cannot book a flight, for example, because your ranking is too low. And on the contrary, if you have a high ranking, then you get better access to jobs and so on. So it's it's all up and running, so it's all there. And this is kind of the. Uh, there's no privacy, of, of course not. So it's kind of really steering the public. So it's, it's, a, it's a tool for steering a whole society. And this is kind of 
this is so frightening for us. This is the opposite of anything that I believe in and of our kind of also European and American values. So it's like, so, so it's, it's all there. I would just like, if you allow me, take, take back here really quickly um, and sort of complicate that a little bit um, by saying that I fully subscribe to what Geisha just said and, and all the many uh, problems that come with that. I would caution us though to um, be mindful of the fact that we are seeing similar things already in place in the US and in, in Europe, just the, you know, just provided through the corporate sector. So, um, whereas it, it's centrally organized in China and the Chinese government manages this and, 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 and does all of that, um, we are seeing similar tendencies and similar workings, uh, you know, at our doorstep as well. They're just not as clear to us. They are part of how we put together and organize our social lives with these tools. And so it becomes even harder for us to understand what is going on and to challenge that. And this is part of what, for example, Frank Pasquale, who is a wonderful legal scholar here in the United States, has called the black box problem, which is not just the problem that we cannot understand the complexity of the algorithm and its prediction based on you know, the complex technological workings, but also the kind of um, bureaucratic and legal um, infrastructure protecting us from looking into the algorithm and its use, trade secrecy. Um, you know, these algorithms are proprietary. Uh, these companies don't have to reveal who their clients are and their clients very well may be police forces or governments. Um, and so we are seeing these kinds of situations here as well. And I do think we need to be very mindful not to say, oh, look what they're doing in China, but also say like, well, what are the similar structures that, that we're seeing here? Because at least in China, it's, everybody knows about it, <laughs> sort of. And, and here it's a little bit more complicated. So since um, China has come up in our conversation, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to pose a question that was asked early on by one of our viewers. There is broad consensus that 5G networks are important for the future, especially in Germany, which has been a laggard in the digital development. But there is a sufficient debate about China's role in Germany's digital development. Huawei wants to sell the world 5G, but Huawei is heavily influenced by the Chinese government. How should we think about 5G and China's role in developing the next generation of digitalization in Germany? That's, that's a difficult question. So there was a lot of debate about uh, Huawei and, and the role. And so um, Germany was taken, the German government was taking a kind of uh, trying to have a middle kind of position. So not kind of banning Huawei uh, as a Chinese company totally, but kind of um, having the regulatory basis um, saying, you know, what is allowed and what is not allowed. So they, they did not want to push what they were calling a Lex Huawei, so a specific, a specific kind of legal requirement, kind of banning Huawei from, the, uh, from, from uh, using their technology, but kind of being open in what kind of um, companies might provide their hardware, um, but being very sure and very precise in allowing, uh, uh, so not allowing kind of backdoors, not allowing legally um, you know, to, to spy on, on, the, uh, on the infrastructure. So I think that there, there was also kind of uh, very different approaches from, from American uh, government and from the German and maybe European government in, you know, what kind of role can Chinese technologies uh, play. And I think that the govern German government's approach is that they want to have um, an intense dialogue and continue the intense dialogue with the Chinese um, uh, uh, government and Chinese partners and companies about um, the regulation of technology and about um, you know about GDPR about privacy and and so on. So I think this this is the German kind of maybe diplomatic way of uh, of um, solving this issue and um, being open to to any kind of partners as long as they obey to the legal requirements. So this is uh, what's the, the reaction of the German government in the last couple of months. It was. I don't have much to add to that because I'm really not an expert in the 5G um, discourse at all. Um, I will say though that I think it is important to think about whether or not 
infrastructures are private or public, privately or publicly owned. Um, and I would consider 5G an infrastructure. And I do think that there's a conversation to be had uh, about that in general on both sides of the Atlantic, who provides that infrastructure, who owns it, and uh, who maintains it in what way, and what does that mean? And we're seeing, especially in this pandemic, an increasingly, um, rely, I mean, obviously we've always relied on, the, on these private infrastructures, but we now it's very clear that we do rely on um, the private, the infrastructures that are provided by big tech companies. And um, big tech companies are in fact, um, in a position whereby they even have enough cash that they, you know, that they are basically economically as powerful as small nations and they are increasingly um, behaving and have to behave uh, like nation states. They do have that power and now that increasingly they have the power of policy making. So their corporate policy making affects a lot, you know, many, many populations and, and nations. And um, we need to think about whether or not that actually uh, squares with um, democratic values and what that means and whether uh, regulation sort of after the fact is the right way to go or whether we maybe need to think about how we can do this in a more uh, intelligent way and think about innovation in a more intelligent way to prevent sort of this after the fact uh, you know, trying to, to fix things um, that can really profoundly challenge our democratic uh, makeup. We, we have this debate very much also when we look at developing countries or to, to African countries, for example. So this, this kind of basic right to have access to the internet uh, and the opportunity that we all believed in that the basic access would make a change for, for different uh, African uh, communities so that they could profit from having access to the internet. This did not become true at all. So we see this digital divide based on the kind of basic infrastructure. We see this happening very much in different African countries. And we saw this initiative, if you remember, this um, uh, Facebook free basic uh, infrastructure. So they were providing kind of free access to uh, accessing the internet but just through Facebook. So Facebook would be the internet and having the, the free access to, uh, to, to Facebook, for example, for, for India. And, uh, and there was an, an uprise in, you know, in, in debate and in criticism that you know, Facebook is not the internet. And it, it's true what we are saying, Mona. So that's, it's not that, that the government um, can you know, lean back and leave the companies, you, know, you can fix this problem of accessibility. This is not the case. And we see uh, many debates in, in different um, African uh, countries, also from South Africa, and uh, that they are taxing now. So there's a taxation on the basic access to, to the internet. So it's getting worse. So the equality of access and the ac accessibility of this basic infrastructure is, uh, is a big issue for many uh, different kinds of, uh, of the developing world of Global South. So thank you. So, so this already covered, covered our um, closing questions. <laughs> Because I was, you know, I think you, you already both mentioned, uh, you know, there's some work to do for policymakers. Uh, it's not that we're just driven by technology. It's, it's the policymakers who are, who are now tasked to find the right regulatory framework um, to tackle all these, these challenges. So, so I think we're running out of time. And um, Steve, I think. Well, Geisha Joost and Mona Sloan, I, I just want to thank you both for this incredibly thought-provoking discussion. Uh, there are a number of issues that we didn't even get into, um, and yet, you know, you both took us um, it, through the United States and Europe, but also around the world in a number of the issues that we talked about. And um, while on some senses we might be skimming the surface and there's a lot more to discuss, we really want to thank you uh, for making the time uh, to join us and our viewers, and I say that on behalf of both 1014 and the American Council on Germany. We look forward to reconvening in person, but we're happy that we had the opportunity to speak today, and hopefully we'll be able to talk again in the not-so-distant future.